Despite being one of the most successful rock bands over the past four decades, Bon Jovi has also attracted their fair share of haters and detractors over the years. In today's video, let's take a look at some of the fellow musicians, establishments, as well as broadcasters who have feuded with the band. Even though Howard Stern would induct Bon Jovi into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2017, and the band has been on his show numerous times, their relationship didn't really start off on the right foot. Stern repeatedly said on his program that he had John and company on a show before they were really famous, but following the band's huge success with their 1986 record Slippery When Wet, they suddenly stopped appearing on his program. Things reached a boiling point in 1988 when the band were promoting their follow-up 1988's New Jersey and they failed to do Stern's show. Stern would write in his 1993 book Private Parts, it started very innocently when I got pissed at Bon Jovi for going on radio stations like local competitor Z100 and WNEW to promote their new album, yet shunning my show. I was mad because we were the only show to promote Bon Jovi when they were nobodies. Things would escalate with Stern getting John's home phone number and confronting him live on the air. John would tell the shock jock that the record company was the one who pushed the band not to do Stern's program. John would go on to say that competitor stations threatened to not play the band's music, and so they avoided Stern. For a period of time, Stern would even call him John Bonfoni, and the frontman at one point offered to babysit Stern's kids and wash his car to make amends, but that did a little to satisfy the shock jock. Guitarist Richie Sambora would try to call in and smooth things over, but that didn't really work. It was in 1992 John and Richie would finally appear on Stern's radio program, and his e-interview show to promote their follow-up record, Keep the Faith. Skid Row, which formed in 1986, was a few years younger than Bon Jovi. Ahead of the band signing with Atlantic Records, John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora would own a publishing company called Underground, who convinced Skid Row to sign with them. As a result, the Bon Jovi pair would own a lion's share of Skid Row's publishing, and Skid Row would release their debut album, which was self-titled in 1989. It would prove to be a massive success, selling over 5 million copies, thanks to singles like Youth Gone Wild, 18 in Life, and I Remember You. As part of the promotion for the album, Skid Row would open for Bon Jovi as part of their New Jersey tour the same year. That publishing deal that Skid Row signed with John and Richie soon became a sour point for frontman Sebastian Bach. Bach would tell a French TV outlet, nobody thought that we would become a big band. That happens all the time in the music industry. John was like, we'll take you on tour, but if you guys make it big, then we get a cut of it. So I was bitter about that for a while, but it would be another event that created a rivalry between the groups. According to Bach's book, 18 in Life, it was when Skid Row's merchandise started to outsell Bon Jovi's that John took exception with him, recalling in his book, that he was summoned into a room by Bon Jovi's frontman writing, he stared me down and said the words, I'll f***ing own you. Bach would also claim that during the tail end of their tours, the bands would play pranks on one another, which was pretty customary. It was ahead of Skid Row's set in Kentucky. Bon Jovi's entourage soaked Bach with ice milk, which resulted in Bach going on stage and slamming Bon Jovi. Skid Row's crew would respond by throwing a carton of eggs at Bon Jovi's crew. It was as Skid Row walked off stage that John and the Bon Jovi crew were waiting for him. With Bach writing, we saw about 60 people coming towards us. Leading the pack was John Bon Jovi himself. Flanking him side to side was his dad and his brother Tony. Behind them was the full Bon Jovi road crew. John would throw a punch at Bach that missed. Bon Jovi's entourage would throw Bach into the dressing room and throw him up against the wall. Bach would recall, Bon Jovi Sr. pointed in my face as I was held up against the wall. He said, I'll f***ing kill you or something like that. Bach would claim that following the incident, he got a congratulatory call from both Lars Ulrich of Metallica and Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses for his actions. But for Bach's bandmates, it put him in a difficult position with Sabo telling Louder Sound. John had freaked out because he thought Sebastian had called him an expletive, but the whole thing was a misunderstanding. And because my singer hadn't done anything wrong, I had to defend him all this mudslinging. Sabo, for his part, would have a strained relationship with Bon Jovi for several years, but it would finally be healed when the pair attended the funeral of a mutual friend. Both John and Richie would eventually relax their rights to Skid Row's publishing under the condition that Bach would sign a gag order, according to Louder Sound. But it would be years later that Bach would mend the fences with John when they happened to be eating at the same London restaurant. In 2019, Bon Jovi was set to play a show in Tel Aviv, Israel, and ahead of that planned concert, Roger Waters would pen an open letter to the band criticizing them for, and I quote, standing shoulder to shoulder with Israel. 
Waters has been a longtime critic of Israel, slamming the country for their treatment of the Palestinians. John would tell an interviewer ahead of his Israel gig, I've always heard what a wonderful place Israel is, the birthplace of all religions. I've been everywhere and Israel was a place that I've always wanted to visit, but it never worked out. As for Waters' letter to the band, a representative for Bon Jovi declined to provide comment to Rolling Stone on the matter. It's always surprised me when bands want to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because, let's face it, it's not a legitimate organization. Bon Jovi have been eligible to be inducted since 2008, but they wouldn't enter the Rock Hall until 2017. They would get their first nomination for induction in 2011, but they would make it in on their second try. John would tell the New York Times that it was a long time coming, telling the paper, the whole process is controlled heavily by Jan Wenner, who is the chairman of the foundation that controls the entire process for the Rock Hall. He's also the publisher of Rolling Stone magazine. It was in 2016 John would appear on The Howard Stern Show and revealed that he used to be on good terms with Winner, but had a falling out with him, revealing The Rock Hall had a personal vendetta against him and his band from being inducted. There was a biography written about Winner where the book's author reported that the Rock Hall chair reportedly said, I don't think he's that important. What does Bon Jovi mean in the history of music? Nothing. Wenner was also unhappy that one of John's billionaire friends, investor Ron Perlman, repeatedly pressed the Rock Hall to induct Bon Jovi. This one is a little eyebrow raising. While the replacements never enjoyed the level of commercial success as Bon Jovi, they would win rave reviews for their music. Bon Jovi, meanwhile, weren't exactly critical darlings, and it was during an interview with Musician Magazine years ago that John was asked a question about the replacements, to which he responded, the last great band of the 80s, Never heard of these guys, but I guess you're an artist if you're on the cover of Musician Magazine. The replacements frontman Paul Westerberg got his own barbin, according to the band's biographer Bob Mayer, answering back saying, how many critical raves has he had referring to Bon Jovi? The replacements frontman reportedly smirked, sure, I might trade bank accounts with Bon Jovi, but I wouldn't want his pants. Years later in 2016, Mayer interviewed John about his comments, to which he responded he had no recollection of making such statements. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again in Rock Culture Stories. Take care.